All right. Hello, everybody. Welcome. Thank you for joining us today. We're really excited to have you for today's PA Presents webinar in collaboration with the UPMC Hillman Cancer Center. My name is Tyler Welsh, and I'm the Associate Director for Campus Constituent Relations at the University of Pittsburgh. Um, before I pass things off to our moderator and our extraordinary panel of doctors, I just have a couple logistical notes. Uh, so first off, thank you in advance for any te technical difficulties that you may experience. Knock on wood, hoping that we don't have any. Uh, but if you do, uh, you can visit support.zoom.us. Uh, and then lastly, you'll see if there's a Q&A box located at the bottom of your screen. Uh, so this is an interactive webinar, so we do encourage you to ask questions throughout the presentation. Uh, for each doctor's segment, uh, we'll have a few minutes afterwards, uh, after their initial segment, to answer those questions. And then we'll have a full dedicated time, about 20 minutes at the end, to go over any unanswered questions that we get through. So uh, definitely utilize that throughout the entire presentation. And we're excited to hear from you as well as from our doctors. Uh, but that being said, I'm going to pass things off to our moderator for today. I'm excited to have Dr. Ferris here with us today, who's the director of UPMC Hillman Cancer Center. Uh, so thank you again for joining us, Dr. Ferris, and uh, we'll pass things over to you. Thank you, Tyler, and good afternoon. Welcome to everybody who's uh, joined. We're really excited uh, uh, to have a phenomenal group of speakers and very interesting topics. Uh, the theme is breast cancer. You may know October is Breast Cancer Awareness Month, where we really focus on this important disease. Uh, and we've got three wonderful superstars to speak to you today. And it's my pleasure uh, to just briefly introduce them. First will be Dr. Steffi Osterreich. Uh, she is a professor of pharmacology uh, and uh, works at the UPMC Hillman Cancer Center, helping lead our cancer biology program in the Women's Cancer Research Center. And she's going to talk about a, a new entity, a unique entity recently recognized and studied that is really an area she's internationally known for called invasive lobular breast cancer, uh, not the typical type that people are uh, perhaps aware of. Then we have uh, Dr. Yanis Zervantanakis studying bioengineering approaches to study breast cancer ecosystems and develop personalized therapies. Uh, and he is a faculty member at Hillman that is a a nice joint collaboration between uh, us and the uh, Department of Bioengineering in the School of Engineering. Uh, and then finally, uh, Dr. Adrian Lee, uh, who is director of the Institute for Precision Medicine, uh, a joint collaboration between Pitt and UPMC. And he's gonna talk about reducing deaths from breast cancer metastasis. Uh, and so I think as you'll see, a tremendous scientific insights with a lot of patient-oriented potential applications, uh, and they'll give examples of where this is impacting on improving uh, life and quality of life uh, in our patients with breast cancer. So thanks so much for tuning in. And now I'll turn it over to, I think, uh, Steffi Osterreich. Great. Thank you so much, Dr. Ferris, for the fantastic introduction. And thanks, Tyler, for giving us an opportunity to present here. So I'm going to share my screen. And uh, as Dr. Ferris and Tyler uh, mentioned, I'm going to talk about uh, invasive lobular breast cancer, a unique entity. And I'm really pleased to give this presentation here today. So I will start with a brief background. Uh, breast cancer affects one in eight women. So it's a very, very frequent uh, disease. There are approximately 300,000 new breast cancer cases in 2023 in the US which is approximately 15% of all cancer. And in frequency, it's the number one ranked uh, cancers in the US. Unfortunately, there are approximately 43,000 deaths in 2023 from breast cancer alone. Again, it's very prevalent. The global incidence is rising by 3% each year. And it's a very complex disease with multiple risk factors. And the risk factors are shown here on the right side of the of the slide some of them are have imply a more moderate and some are stronger risk uh, brca1 mutations associated with family history prior breast cancer uh, confer a high risk of uh, getting breast cancers others and aging actually is really a disease of aging uh, others are not that strong but clearly associated with an increased risk and i just mentioned them here having an early menarche or late menopause, prolonged hormone replacement therapy, nulliparity, age older than 35 at birth of the first child, dense breast, 
early lesions like atypical ductal and global hyperplasia and lifestyle. Breast cancer is really somewhat of a poster child for understanding the tremendous heterogeneity. Breast cancer does not equal breast cancer. We have molecular heterogeneity and histologically, and I will briefly explain both. So when you think about molecular heterogeneity, we really have a number of molecular subtypes. The most prevalent is luminal A and luminal B breast cancer. You can see this here in blue in the pie chart followed by HER2 enriched and basal-like. So what does it mean? And you can see this here on the right side. The tumors, which are luminal A and luminal B, are mostly ER positive. So I should explain this. ER stands for estrogen receptor. That's the receptor for the female hormone estrogen and progesterone receptor, the receptor for progesterone. So the luminal A, luminal B express estrogen receptor and progesterone receptor. The HER2 oncogene is expressed in some of luminal B and in the HER2 enriched breast tumors. And then we have a subset labeled the basal-like, also overlapping, you might have heard the term, triple negative breast cancer. They don't express ER, PR, or HER2. So these are these basal-like or triple negative. And that molecular subtype really determines therapy, therapeutic approaches. And this is shown here on the bottom of the slide. So in general, just averaging it, the uh, clinical prognosis is better in luminal A, and it is worse, at least short-term outcome for basal-like triple negative breast cancers. The luminal tumors, the patients are treated with hormonal therapy. Tumors which express HER2 receive anti-HER2 therapy. And the mainstay for basal-like or triple negative is chemotherapy. But the topic of my presentation today is not necessarily the molecular subtypes, but a different uh, measure of heterogeneity. And these are these histological subtypes. The majority of tumors are so-called carcinoma of no special type, NST, previously called invasive ductal carcinoma. So you might see IDC or NST, and that stays for the same kind of histological subtype. The most special type of cancer, the most special histological subtype, is the invasive lobular carcinoma, ILC. It's 10 to 15% of all breast cancers followed by mixed disease and others. There are approximately 20 special subtypes, this invasive lobular carcinoma being the most frequent one. What is it? What's ILC? ILC is, in contrast to NST or IDC, the tumor cells grow much more in a line. So the tumor cells don't touch each other as much, and you have more space in between the tumor cells, it will be called the stroma. Uh, the reason they don't touch each other is that they lose a gene called ecotherin. Ecotherin is really the glue of the cells. You can see this here. This is a molecule which uh, goes through the membrane and it basically brings cells together. It causes cell cell attachment and then singles signals to the cytoskeleton of the cells. It makes them move, it shapes them, but it also really turns on signal transduction pathways in the cell. As a result of these, these cells grow in long sheets, like I already mentioned, they grow more like in spider webs and it's not a lump in the breast, which causes one of the major issues that it is very difficult to detect by uh, regular imaging. And like I mentioned already, they're mostly estrogen receptor, progesterone receptor positive, and not so much or two expression. They don't proliferate fast. So a marker for proliferation KI67 is relatively low. This slide just summarizes the uh, features of ILC in general. Some of those I'll come back to. Uh, patients are diagnosed at an older age, approximately four to five years older compared to NSC or IDC. The tumors are larger in part because they can't be picked up by imaging or not as good. More late stage tumors, mostly are positive. And very often the tumors are more multifocal. There are multiple spots within one breast and very often it's on both breasts, resulting in part in higher frequency of uh, mastectomies. 
there are unique features of metastasis. There are modulated recurrences, and there are unique sites of metastasis, uh, for example, in the urogenital tract as well as in the GI tract. There's an enrichment of specific mutations in the uh, ILC. They are more frequent compared to IDC. And this includes mutation NF1 and ERB2 and the HER2 gene. And in addition, we also have ER mutation, estrogen receptor mutation themselves, which cause resistant to hormonal therapy. We and other groups have shown there is unique biology and they are listed here. Growth factor receptors are proteins on the cell membrane, which take signals from the stroma and turn on proliferation as well as metastasis. And there seem to be unique signaling within these growth factor receptors in ILC. Metabolism of the cells seem to be different as well as uh, there's increasing evidence that there are some differences in immune infiltration, especially with respect to macrophages. Here you can see again these uh, the features of the tumor that the cells aren't attached, and you can stain for specific proteins in these ILCs called P120, which is very dominant in the in the cell as a as a in response to loss of ecoterin. There are a couple of mutated genes, and within ILC we have more molecular subtypes listed here. We, uh, a few years ago, we collaborated what we call within the Great Lakes Breast Cancer Consortium. So there's a lot of uh, collaborations ongoing, not only within uh, Pittsburgh here, but collaboration with Cleveland Clinic, Case Western Ohio State. And we basically analyze clinical records for more than 30,000 patients, 3,000 of them ILC, and then compare what's different, what's different in treatment, what's different in outcome. And, uh, you know, I invite you to look at this study if you are interested in it. But I think one of the most important uh, results is shown here on the right side. So this is what we call a Kaplan-Meier survival curve. On the x-axis, you have time since diagnosis. And here is a probability of survival. And this is either disease-free survival, so does the tumor come back or not, or overall survival of the patient. And uh, blue is IDC cancer and red is ILC. And you can see that for the first few years, the outcome, the recurrence as well as overall survival is similar. But then between six, seven years, the curve separate and long-term survival is worse for patients with ILC than IDC as a result of uh, late recurrence. So tumor basically comes back six, seven, eight, nine years later. We are very interested in this, uh, what is, why is that, and what are the sites of metastasis? And we have collaborated with Peck Rosenzweig here at uh, UPMC at the McGee Metastatic uh, Breast Cancer Database site, who has really over the years collected massive information uh, from patients with metastatic disease shown here on the right. We uh, differentiate in metastatic sites between IDC and ILC, and what you can see easily is that the metastasis to the lung and liver is less in patient with ILC, but you have more these unique metastases to the GI tract, the urogenital tract, as well as to the ovary. They are very uh, sometimes unexpected, and it's really important to educate not only the patient, but actually uh, the physician that there needs to be the lookout for unique sites of metastasis. There are even metastases to the eye, and this is a paper we recently published, uh, realizing that in patients with ILC, you can actually have metastases to the orbital or periorbital space. I just have a few slides on uh, scientific focus areas we are working on. One is this growth factor receptor signaling I mentioned earlier, where the tumor cells in lobular breast cancer, and you can see these purple dots here, are much more surrounded by the stroma, which is very rich in growth factors. An example is IGF. And IGF then turns on the receptor and makes the cells proliferate or makes, them meta makes the cells metastasize. In part, we think the growth factors are more active because when you lose ecoterin, the cell glue, the cells spread out more and these 
factors in the membrane have more space to bind to their ligands and turn on uh, transcription. The reason this is very important clinically is that some of the growth factor receptors which become active are now druggable. The best example is HER2, and we might hear more uh, from Janis on this. There are now uh, approximately 10% of tumors, and this is higher on ILC than IDC, who have which have HER2 mutation. And there's an increasing repertoire of drugs which have very high efficacy for tumors which have HER2 mutation. So we are specifically interested in the mechanism of action and response to drugs. They're called tyrosine kinase inhibitors or ADC, antibody drug candidates, targeting HER2 tumors. I'm also very happy to say that there are actually a couple of trials ongoing targeting other growth factor receptors in ILC. And this is uh, relatively new when the trials are listed here. Everybody is excited about the potential of immune therapy. It has been very successful for a few cancer types. Unfortunately, breast is not necessarily one of them. Uh, we need to do more in estrogen receptor positive breast cancer. There's been some progress in triple negative in HER2, but in estrogen receptor positive, we need to do more. There's a group in uh, the Netherlands. They did a trial in patients with ILC, specifically with metastatic ILC, treating the patients with uh, immune checkpoint blockade drugs and carboplatin. And there were a few responses. Uh, this is basically time after starting on this trial until there was a uh, progression or in some cases a uh, patient pass. This is again in the metastatic setting. So we had a few responses there, partial response or stable disease, but the trial was early terminated because of really lack of more responses. Correlative studies have shown that there is an immune response and we really just need to understand it more to make more use of the immune system in ER positive ILC as well as IDC. I should say that we have collaborated with a large number of investigators here in Pittsburgh and we just have published a very large study understanding the infiltration of immune cells into ILC and in comparison in IDC as well. So there's, this is a very active area of research and we should all be prepared that there's more coming out in the estrogen receptor positive breast cancer arena with respect to immune therapy over the next few years. So to summarize, invasive lobular breast cancer has distinct clinical features, but there are currently no differences in treatment of the patients. There are some differences in management with respect to imaging and surgery, but we really strive to have uh, uh, ILC-specific treatment. There's an increased understanding of the biology underlying these unique features, and there are now some clinical trials specifically for patients with ILC. I should say the area is really a fantastic area for massive collaborations locally here in Pittsburgh, nationally, in the area, in the Great Lakes area, and also internationally. And these collaborations include a very active uh, patient advocacy group with a goal, again, to implement precision medicine for patients with ILC in, an order, in order to find the improved survival. And I'm very happy to say that we just finished a meeting here in just a few weeks ago in Pittsburgh, an ILC symposium, which brought together researchers, clinicians, and advocates from uh, the US, Canada, Europe, uh, Asia. It was really a fantastic meeting. This is just a picture of the patient advocates who participated. We had this meeting here in the assembly and you can see we even, you know, there was not only science, uh, like the poster session, this is a keynote, but we even, you know, we went, we had a yoga session and we took the pit bus to go to the, uh, to the baseball game and uh, to the river to do a cruise. And uh, it was a fantastic meeting, 220 person in person there from 15 countries. And it again stimulated a lot of collaborations. And I'm very, very happy to say that Due to the work we do here in Pittsburgh, I think the field has really moved forward and I'm very optimistic that there will be soon a uh, specific uh, treatment uh, for patients with ALC. And yeah, I thank you for your attention and that concludes my presentation.
Okay. Awesome. Thank you very much, Dr. Wright. Appreciate it. Uh, looks like right now, I don't think we have any pending questions coming in. Uh, so this was awesome. Uh, we will hear from Dr. Wright again later uh, in the presentation, if anybody has any outstanding questions for her. Uh, but I believe next, we're going to keep on moving to our next segments over here. Uh, so we have Dr. Yanis Zervantinakis, uh, who is going to be talking about bioengineering approaches to study breast cancer tumor. Uh, so with that being said, we can hand it over to you and uh, move on with our next segment. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for the um, introductions. And I would also like to thank Steffi very much for setting up the stage and the motivation for uh, new approaches uh, via which we can better understand immune uh, interactions of the tumor cells with the immune cells and other cells such as fibroblasts that impact treatment response and, um, uh, and um, disease progression such as metastasis or so the late recurrences that we saw. So, um, our lab is interested in taking uh, taking a systems approach, a systems engineering approach, where um, the 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 responses in the clinic and the responses in animal models. We're using a lot of mouse models to study uh, to control the environment of the tumor and have different genetic backgrounds, as well as the uh, the biology inside the tumor cells is in the center. And we're taking two approaches. We're taking an experimental approach by which we are building these chips, these microfluidic devices. Uh, many of you may have heard of human on a chip, organ on a chip. I will uh, present a bit on that uh, uh, in the next slides, where in these chips, we can introduce immune cells and we can study how fast these immune cells are moving towards the tumor. Uh, we can study drug response and uh, different uh, environments where we can have a tumor that is uh, responding to therapy and a tumor that is failing to respond to therapy. So that's the experimental approach that we have in the lab where we're designing uh, new microfluidic devices to study how cancer cells interact with their environment. And we're also having a computational part in the lab where we're essentially building the interactions using mathematical models or statistical models by which cells interact with cancer cells interact with other cancer cells and with their environment. And with this combination of new experimental uh, tools and computational approaches, we want to better understand uh, why are some uh, genetic context results or uh, some environmental exposures result into increased metastatic risk and how uh, do these uh, interactions between cancer cells here shown in, uh, in magenta and uh, other cells such as macrophages and fibroblasts affect. So I will start first with uh, describing some studies. I have three three examples and I should time myself. Let me make sure I time myself so that we're in time. time myself. I have three examples that I would like to present. The first example involves uh, HER2 positive breast cancer. As Steffi mentioned, it's a subtype of breast cancer for which we have a lot of targeted therapies, but in a lot of the, in the advanced disease, metastatic disease, there are still incidents of, of uh, recurrence. And in this particular case, we're focusing on the interactions between cancer cells shown here in magenta and fibroblasts. Um, fibroblasts are uh, cells in, in our tissues that uh, promote, uh, that produce the glue or that's the uh, secreted or secreted glue that uh, makes the extracellular matrix components of fibroblasts deposit matrix and degrade the matrix. So in the case of dense breast, for example, there is a, a lot of collagen and fibroblasts are responsible for, are partially responsible for uh, creating this stiff environment. Very excitingly, we're also finding out that fibroblasts interact with uh, other immune cells and they can impact immunotherapy response. So in the first part of the talk, I will, I will be focusing on how fibroblasts interact with cancer cells in the context of drug resistance, here to therapy drug resistance. So 
uh, there is a lot of emphasis in um, in research, breast cancer researchers in ident in being able to push these curves, these um, relapse free survival curves, to be all hundred percent, so that no patient will exhibit a result. Uh, in many cases, we want to understand which are the patients which are at risk. So we want to find signatures. We want to find properties of the tumor, uh, which will allow us to identify the, the patients that are at risk. So in this particular example here, patients that have a dense tissue with high stroma, high expression of a number of these genes, red is high expression, such as um, Blau, collagen 1A2, these patients will exhibit a shorter relapse-free survival. So following um, treatment, the, the tumor will come back faster. So particularly in HER2 positive disease, about 50% of the of the metastatic patients will exhibit drug resistance. So we are very interested in developing new experimental and computational tools, I will be focusing on the computational today, to study how do these cells, fibroblasts that produce the matrix, impact the response of cancer cells to targeted therapies. And then once we know the context over which we have poor response to therapy due to fibroblasts, what approaches can we take to develop a combination therapy in the lab, in with animal models, and then motivate working with our um, clinician, clinician collaborators to develop uh, phase one trials and then in the future uh, have this as an opportunity for patients who respond poorly to HER2. So this study started with some um, experiments that I did um, um, in animal models where we formed um, uh, localized DCIS ductal carcinoma in situ tumors in a, in a, in a mouse and we for, and we saw that when we treat these tumors with the um, one of one small molecule inhibitor which is uh, given in the metastatic settings we saw that a lot of these tumors regress so here um, you see there are these there are this necrotic core and there is only a thin a slice of tumor cells left however if you look at another part of the tumor on the right here and we zoom in there are a number of tumor ducts that I saw with my, my cursor that seem that they are not responding to therapy. So this led us to hypothesize that there is a niche or a local um, uh, neighborhood in the tumor where cancer cells can resist the effects of targeted therapy. So to better understand under what conditions can uh, cancer cells resist the response resist the uh, cytotoxic effects of uh, this here to targeted agents, we started with uh, experiments in the lab where now we can uh, label these fibroblasts here, they're labeled in, in white, and track the proliferation um, of the tumor cells. So the tumor cells are labeled in green, uh, the nuclei are labeled in green, so we can actually count how many cancer cells we have over time. And with this experimental data, we can start building mathematical models. And we have different types of mathematical models. One type of mathematical model is this agent-based stochastic simulation, where the tumor cells are in green, the fibroblasts in blue. So we start in this, um, you know, grid architecture, but we can uh, make it, uh, uh, we can have different complexities of neighborhoods. And where defining the rules by which cancer cells can grow or die in response to therapy. And what we're trying to do is find the rules in the mathematical model that would recreate the experiment. And in this way, we can have a mathematical model that can predict the experiment response. Ultimately, the goal is to predict what is happening in a more complex system. And this way, we have a, a computational test bed to test different uh, treatment scenarios or different combination therapies. So I'll play this movie. Uh, so we start, the, the cancer cells are um, randomly proliferating at some point. And once we um, add the treatment, now we add the treatment, so we can actually see that the color changes is a pseudo coloring. Um, the cancer cells will start to proliferate in areas um, where there are uh, different fibroblasts. Uh, this is just 
a demonstration with agent-based simulation. The other uh, approach we took, and that has implications for um, personalizing therapies based on the density of the, of the breast tissue, so patients who have high or low stroma, is with, uh, with a mechanism-based model where this is an ordinary differential equation-based model. And here, what our goal is to understand what should be the dose of the therapy that will result into a white color, which would be um, cytotoxic. So the number of tumor cells would be reducing given different um, density of uh, different density of fibroblasts. This can allow us to match the uh, intensity of treatment according to how uh, dense uh, or um, fibroblast reach the environment is. So the mathematical models hold um, a lot of promise in personalizing uh, therapeutic responses. And there is a saying in the field that every patient should have their equation, mathematical equation to uh, um, individualize treatments. And now I'll switch in an experimental um, um, technology that we use that started with uh, microprocessor technology. So you can think the chips that are in our iPhones or in other uh, computers. So uh, in the 1990s, um, um, these microprocessor technologies were uh, started to be used for doing chemistry in a, in a chip. And then about 10 years later, uh, this chemistry in a chip um, started to be used with culturing cells by introducing a new material, PDMS. So this is where I started my, my training. And um, I was involved in this revolution of the mi microfluidics field where we started uh, using these microchips to culture cells and recreate tumor ecosystems and organ-organ interactions outside of the body in a controlled way so we can study how cancer cells respond to, to drugs, how do immune cells infiltrate. So this field right now has uh, dramatically been altered also by the FDA uh, um, Modernization Act with the goal of using some of these chips to replace some of the animal testing. And the advantages are that you can have a full human uh, system. You can actually use um, cells directly from patients who are willing to donate their tissue and test therapies in these micro, micro platforms. Uh, as engineers, we are... Again, I'm friendly. I'll try to wrap up in two minutes. As engineers, we're very excited about um, enabling new measurements. So we think that we really need to develop devices that we can do new measurements. And in these systems, we can essentially count how many cells are migrating in response to an extracellular stimuli. And the extracellular stimuli that we can control are oxygen, fluid flow, and different cell cultures. So I'll be highlighting how one of the cells in our uh, immune system, macrophages, responds to, um, to interactions with the cancer cells. So macrophages can be recruited by uh, tumor cells to infiltrate into the tumor. So we wonder what are the ways through which uh, we can have a macrophage rich microenvironment uh, through what ways can cancer cells bring in macrophages that then associate with poor response to immunotherapy? So um, we developed a microfluidic device with 3D matrix that allowed us to visualize the interactions between uh, these green cells infiltrating macrophages and tumor cells. So now we can uh, start to uh, uh, dissect what are the mechanisms that tumor cells utilize to recruit macrophages? And we found that in the areas where there was a lot of tumor cell motion, macrophages infiltrated. Um, and this led to a treatment, a targeted treatment on the cancer cell cytoskeleton that we're uh, interested in following on in vivo studies. And I'll end with one slide on uh, immunotherapy. These macrophages, have been shown uh, a high number of macrophages in patients who received uh, hair to targeted therapy has been shown with a poor uh, number of T cells. So macrophages prevent the, the T cells which are attacking the tumor from uh, entering the tissue. 
And what we have been able to show with our uh, in vitro model systems is that when we recreate the environment of uh, T cell attack on the tumor, so now the T cells are green and the tumor cells are red, in the absence of macrophages, the tumor cells, the T cells can eliminate the tumor cells. But in the presence of macrophages, the macrophages are sealed, are binding to the T cells and are shielding the tumor cells from uh, immune attack. And with that, I would like to uh, thank um, our lab members, funding, and uh, I'll be happy to take questions. Thank you. There are some questions on the ILC presentation, so maybe I'm not sure we should take it. Yeah, it looks like we did have one question come in from the previous uh, presentation. I know uh, everybody's getting to their questions for that, so we'll let Steffi take that one really quick before we get to the next segment with Adrian Lee. So the question is, um, going back to the previous one, if imaging is not effective, not an effective diagnosis, uh, how was ILC diagnosed? Yes, no, that's a, that's a great question. So, you know, I shouldn't say it doesn't work at all. It's just not as effective. So therefore, very often, you know, the, the tumor is larger or later stage by the time it is diagnosed. There is a lot of research ongoing showing that other modalities of imaging, such as MRI, uh, ultrasound might have higher efficacy. And I should say, most excitingly, there are now tracers being developed. And I think uh, the, the most important is uh, labeled estradiol for what we call FES, PET imaging. So there are, uh, there's a lot of research ongoing, although I should say we need more where you can different where you can use different imaging modalities to pick up the disease uh, in addition to just mammography. And I would also say not in the early setting, but in the advanced setting, there is a lot of research on using liquid biopsies. And I would say maybe this is an absolutely perfect transition to, to Dr. Adrian Lee who is going to talk about liquid biopsy, the idea that we can actually pick up the disease in the blood. So lots of stuff, lots of exciting stuff happening in that area. I hope that answers the question. I should say actually, and I don't know, Tyler, if you, I mean, just really feel free to contact us, share our email address and people can contact us afterwards for, for more detailed information. We'll be happy to, to work with you guys. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you for that. Um, and for everybody listening, uh, this is being recorded. So we will send up a follow-up email uh, either later today or first thing in the morning uh, that will have the recording for this. So you can rewatch and then there'll be other helpful resources. Uh, so I know the contacts for all of our panelists will be on there. Uh, so like Steffi says, feel free to reach out anytime. Uh, so that'll be in the follow-up email. Uh, that being said, uh, I think that was a nice transition to Dr. Lee over here. Uh, so we'll pass things over to you now. Thank you very much and welcome everyone. Uh, it's great to be able to present to you today. Um, and I will be talking about reducing deaths from breast cancer metastasis. So as Steffi said, I should say, Steffi said, uh, breast cancer is the number one diagnosis in women, it's 300,000 cases a year. And unfortunately over 40,000 uh, men and women die from breast cancer each year where they're specifically dying from breast cancer metastasis when it spreads to other parts of the body. And we're very focused on trying to understand the process of metastasis. Why does breast cancer spread to other organs? And then can we try and block that or reduce that? What we have learned over the years is, as this says, cancer evolves over time and in response to therapy. So you have your normal breast cells, they change over time, they get mutations in their DNA, their DNA gets mutated, a diagnosis, they're quite complex, as Steffi had said, there's multiple cell types and, and multiple different um, um, cells in here. When you, and this is often cut out by surgery and you have a tissue here, when that metastasizes, it's changed, it's evolved, it's adapted, and it's actually a different disease. And when it finally uh, uh, comes back later, it's also a different disease. And so you get this evolution over time. And these tumors are essentially not the same. You have this evolving, changing, type of disease. 
And we have learned this through research, through sequencing these various um, tissues. And we are heavily reliant on patients donating their tissue under consent to allow us to do that research. Having said that, uh, deaths from breast cancer have declined over 40% over the last 30 years. All of that decrease is due to lab and clinical research like you're hearing, hearing today, which has led to better treatments and outcomes. And we expect this is only going to increase. So here's a simple example of how breast cancer changes over time. Uh, Steffi mentioned and, and Giannis before me both mentioned this HER2, one of the major drivers of breast cancer. This is a patient who had primary breast cancer. So this is the breast cancer from the breast stained for this protein HER2 and it's negative. There's no color, there's no brown color here. When this breast cancer metastasized to the brain, stained for HER2, you now see it's positive. So the tumor has adapted and changed over time. This is important because this has a therapeutic importance. You could target this with an anti-HER2 therapy such as Herceptin. When you look at the DNA of that tumor to see what's going on there, this is the DNA uh, from the primary breast cancer. Anything above the line means you may have too much DNA and below the line means you have too little DNA and it looks pretty standard. In the brain, this is the DNA from the brain. You can see the pattern looks nearly identical. If you look here, it's identical in the primary to the metastasis. There's only one difference, this one peak here, which is actually the gene for HER2. So this tumor has managed to increase the amount of this gene that increases the amount of HER2 and that's presumably one of the reasons it ended up recurring in the brain. Um, and this gives us insight into how these things are metastasizing. That's just one example. We then do that on multiple patients. And you can see, for instance, these four patients here, this is their primary tumor where the levels of HER2 are quite low. And when they metastasize, you can see in the brain, they become very high. And we use this now as an indicator for trying to identify novel therapies and novel targets. So just one example, simple example of how the breast cancer is evolving over time, it's changing and it's a different disease. Sometimes it's a different disease when it recurs, you need to rebiopsy it. And that gives us opportunities for precision medicine to give the right treatment to the right patient at the right time for their disease they have at that moment. The challenge is obviously getting access to this metastatic tissue. For instance, we can't biopsy the brain. That came from a, that what you saw in that example was a craniotomy that that brain had, that patient had to remove that brain lesion. Um, access to these metastatic lesions are challenging due to biopsy. Um, we um, can study organ tropism if we got that tissue. Uh, we can get large amounts of tissue if we do something called an autopsy where patients donate at the time of, um, of death. Um, and we can generate models and we can study drug resistance. And we have a program here in the in Pittsburgh, it's one of the largest in the country where we um, consent patients um, at uh, uh, during their breast cancer journey. And uh, when they pass away, they donate their bodies, just like you might be donating your body for organ donation on your driver's license, very similar, they're donating it for research. We have about 85 patients consented and, and have done about uh, 25 to 30 of these. And this is Steffi at a recent meeting a couple of months ago these are the major groups, um, one internationally and three in the US, um, and Steffi was representing our group there. Uh, this gives you an example here. We've consented 84 patients. We've performed 28 autopsies from patients who died from breast cancer. This shows you the type of organ and tissue that we collect from these autopsies. And I'll just show you one example. Uh, this example here is a, a male who had breast cancer passed away and we took uh, uh, much of their liver here. We isolated many samples from the liver. This is estrogen receptor staining, what Steffi told you about earlier. And it ranges from very high to very low, suggesting that we can learn about the uh, expression of these biomarkers throughout the tissue and helps us understand the targets which are most critical for treatment. And this just shows you, this is the liver full of tumor tissue um, and this is the staining. You can see it's going from very high to absolutely absent. So this allows us an incredible opportunity through a program that we run at Pittsburgh that's incredibly expensive, incredibly difficult to run. This is all done by volunteers who come into the lab in the middle of the night. Um, that gives us an, a unique opportunity to try and understand the metastatic disease. 
And I should say we do this, uh, this is called uh, Hope for Others, our tissue helping enhance research and science. And we do this in collaboration with a large um, patient adv advocacy group as well. Um, we now have participated in a national network. So this is our local program here in Pittsburgh, and we've participated in a national network to do this. This was just recently published um, earlier this year. And I led the what's called the Data Coordinating Center for this program. So tissue was collected all over the country. It was analyzed and all the data came to Pittsburgh, where we work with the supercomputing center between Pitt and Carnegie Mellon to host all that data and analyze it. And this is huge, uh, huge amounts of data that we're analyzing here. Um, and then we make that data publicly available to others. And this uh, study was published and really showed most of what I told you that we've learned that the tumors are evolving over time. Um, subsequent to this, because uh, we were quite successful in developing this network, uh, we've now been funded to develop something called a global data hub whereby uh, through the Breast Cancer Research Foundation, we are now ingesting not just this trial, but multiple trials to make all the data available in one central location for all researchers. And this is good for Pittsburgh because people then are coming to Pittsburgh and recognizing Pittsburgh as the place to get uh, breast cancer data. I will end by just saying what Steffi said, and that relates to that question earlier about detection. Um, there's been this incredible excitement and probably one of the most transformative events that is happening and going to happen in cancer research and treatment is something called a liquid biopsy. So if you take blood from a patient with cancer, any cancer, that blood is gonna contain, contain two things that are of interest to cancer uh, uh, diagnosis and treatment. There'll be what's called circulating tumor cells. These are actually tumor cells that are intact slough off from the tumor and end up in the blood. They are exceedingly rare, but if you can isolate them, which is a kind of a bioengineering or engineering kind of challenge, but if you can isolate them, they're one in a billion, um, you can then study them. But more easy, there's DNA floating around, which is coming from the tumor. And that's very easy to isolate, incredibly simple. We do this all the time. You can isolate this, and then you can look at changes in the DNA of the tumor that's in the blood that's representative of the tumor that might be growing in the pancreas or the liver or, or the breast, for example. This is called a liquid biopsy. Some of you may have had this or heard about this. Very exciting area of, of research because and treatment because anyone can give blood. It's readily accessible. This is uh, gonna change the way we think about this because you could do this for cancer detection. We already have a assay running here whereby you take a blood test and it, and it can not only uh, predict or tell whether you have disease, it can actually predict where it's coming from. So without, you could be a healthy individual and it says, hey, you may have pancreatic cancer and then we uh, send those patients for extra screening. It can understand the molecular profiling of the disease. You can look for detection of residual disease. I, I did surgery. Did I get rid of all the tumor? You want this to go to zero. If it doesn't, that's a problem, a clear problem. And then you can monitor response and monitor clonal evolution during advanced disease. We do this actively. This is an example of blood we've collected at um, Pitt and UPMC in patients with metastatic breast cancer. This shows you over time the number of bloods we've collected. And this is the number of progressions of therapy that patients have had and number of bloods. We've collected 804 collections from 292 unique patients, probably one of the largest collections in the country. And this comes from us having a robust clinic and a, a robust collection platform. So to summarize, uh, breast cancers evolve as they progress from primary disease to metastasis. There's both natural evolution and then drug-induced selection, i.e. when you give drug tumors cells want to get around that treatment and so they evolve and change and we can monitor that now. Uh, we know that new actionable therapeutic targets are acquired in metastasis. I showed you that case of the HER2 in the brain metastasis. And if we can re-biopsy and now using our advanced technologies, we can really apply precision medicine. We can find what's the new driver of the disease and can we target that? I didn't show you this, but what we really found from that Aurora study is there's this uh, reduced immune infiltrate and complex immune evasion that goes on in tumors. And this is something obviously um, the Hillman Cancer Center is working actively to try and uh, turn this around. And finally, I 
lastly, I showed you that evolution can be monitored with liquid biopsies. This is a true game changer for both research and for clinical treatment. Um, and I think it's going to enhance our ability to do precision medicine and then to apply uh, precision therapies. I will end by just thanking the lab. I run the lab together with Steffi. We run the lab together. This is the lab here. We're lucky to be funded by a number of agencies. We thank the patients who donate their time and tissue. We couldn't do this uh, without all of this and our clinical colleagues who we collaborate with. Thank you very much. And I'd be happy to take any questions. All right, awesome. Thank you very much, Dr. Lee. Uh, thank you very much to all of our doctors over here today. Uh, we have about 10 minutes left to take any questions. So again, please enter them into the Q&A box uh, for any questions that you have, and we'll get to addressing them. Uh, while you're typing out your questions, uh, just a quick minute before we get to those, I do want to share for any of our uh, medical students or any of our residents that are uh, on the presentation today, uh, we do have this to get your OCC credit uh, for today. So I'll leave this up just for a second over here um, so you can scan it, receive your credit. Um, and also anybody that's not with us live, anybody who's watching the recording, uh, hopefully you stayed through the whole thing. So this is where you can find it uh, to get your credit over here. Uh, so instructions are also up. So if you don't have time to download the app and get all that going right now, uh, again, the recording will go out tomorrow. Uh, so you can check this out then. So if you don't download it now, you can always uh, do it then as well. Uh, but like I said, we will we are recording this session. So everything will go out uh, either later today or tomorrow and you'll receive more resources uh, as well as uh, ways to follow up with our doctors over here. Uh, so I'm looking as we're waiting for people to type some questions. Uh, we don't have anything in the Q&A box yet, but we do have somebody that has their hand raised over here. Uh, so it looks like Barbara Casillo, uh, I guess it's actually kind of an easier way. Um, I will unmute you uh, so you'll have a chance to talk and then hopefully one of our panelists can uh, answer your question for you. Uh, so go ahead, Barbara, you're, you're welcome to talk. Hey, while Barbara is getting ready, Adrian, there is a, there is a question on liquid biopsy. Do you see that? Yeah, I saw that from Heather. Yeah, that's a great question. So liquid biopsies um, have been used for the last several years. And if you know anyone with cancer, some of them are actually getting them actively. Most lung cancer cases, for example, are now getting them. Um, they're being adapted. Um, they were first used to try and find therapeutic targets, and that's their most active use at the moment. The newest use is for looking for minimal residual disease after you've had surgery. Does all of the circulating tumor go away? And the new assays for actual detection of disease. So in healthy individuals, if you're going for screening, your yearly screen um, with your PCP, we have that test called GRAIL, which is um, one of the major tests now, is active in our UPMC executive health plan um, as a pilot. And I expect that that's, many of those tests are gonna get rolled out over the next one to two years. Great, thank you. We have a couple other uh, questions coming through right now. So whoever wants uh, to address these, um, and the one I'm looking at just came in from Maureen. Uh, so currently, uh, so let's see the question here. Uh, so basically any volunteer in the lab if you're receiving any kind of chemo or anything, uh, can you volunteer in the lab or is it only for medical professionals? Steffi, do you want to ask that? Yeah, I was just, I was just about to say, Giannis, do you want to take this? <laughs> so no, we have, we have, I think all levels of expertise in, in the lab. I think there are, you know, medical professionals, they are researchers, they are undergraduate students, they are people who just want to learn a little bit about, uh, you know, about research. So it's pretty wide open. I mean, Janus, maybe you can expand on this a bit more, yeah? On the diverse, exp yes, I think um, definitely we'll be happy to, um, you can email us directly and we can talk based on the uh, specific case about ways to you can definitely visit and come and see we can actually come check out the as we're watching the cells under the microscope anyone is welcome to email us and 
happy to talk more. Um, there is one question on here to expression and provide an advantage for sales to metastasis. I don't know if Adrian, you want to, since you saw the metastasis, you want to, I can also see. That. I thought, yeah, maybe you can tell, I mean, I can say that um, we are actively, and many groups are actively trying to understand why HER2 positive breast cancer tends to go to the brain more than other subtypes. Um, it's a complex systems biology um, uh, reason for that. I don't know, Yanis, if you want to add to that. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to add to that. Um, we're very interested actually in understanding, um, and this is something we can study in the lab, the ability of cells to grow in a foreign environment versus growing their initial environment. And in these microfluidic systems that I presented, you can actually have flow, recirculating flow that would mimic some aspect of the circulation. So now we can engineer the cells to have with or without the hair to mutation or hair to amplification or a mutation, and then visualize in real time what is the fate of the cancer cells that have the mutation versus don't have the mutation. And I should just say, just to follow up, we do also, similar to Yanis, Yanis does it more in an engineering lab manner, but we also do this using animal models as well, trying to see if uh, we can increase experimentally the, how the cells go to the brain and then try and block that with to try and develop new therapeutic strategies. Yeah, and there is a question on P10 mutation. And uh, so, you know, P10 provides a break for very important pathways in the cell like PI3 kinase, AKT signaling. So we are working really actively on this. Uh, in part, I we're focusing on this because in invasive lobular breast cancer, the PI3 kinase AKT pathway is more activated. So, and when we compare mutations between IDC and ILC, the P loss of P10 or activating mutations in PI3 kinase AKT seem to be enriched in invasive lobular breast cancer. So there's an interest, especially also because it provides therapeutic opportunities. So inactivating P10 or activating PI3 kinase in AKT, they are now really, really good. I shouldn't, I mean, the, the clinical trials look really promising, for example, for targeting AKT. So I think we should act expect more in that in that area over the next few months uh yeah it's a, it's a great question i want to add up to this i think this is a very important question because in our recent paper we showed that depending on if the um tumor has a p p10 copy number loss or pa3k mutation how they interact with the fibroblast changes so you have some cases where the tumor may not have these alterations and the fibroblast can help it. But then you have other cases where the tumor has this alteration, so it does no longer need the fibroblast to survive the therapeutic stress. So this is really critical for therapeutic intervention and personalizing therapy, as Steffi was saying. So this is really critical to understand this. And if we can detect these mutations early on with liquid biopsy, maybe the therapy can uh, be personalized or switched depending on the treatment response. So these are really critical points. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you, everyone. Well, that just about wraps up uh, our segment for today. Uh, so like I say, I'm going to send a follow-up before we log off over here. Uh, just a couple of notes. I am going to drop just a, a quick poll, just a quick satisfaction poll over here. Uh, so if you can literally just take three seconds uh, for anyone <laughs> watching uh, just to rate us really quick so we can take any feedback uh, for next time. Uh, and then also we dropped in the chat, which will also uh, be in the follow-up email. Uh, but if anybody wants to give or to donate uh, to our breast cancer program, uh, we have a link to that. Always appreciative. Like I said, that will be in the follow-up too. We can find the link uh, along with resources, um, contacts for our presenters, uh, as well as the recording um, too. So be on the lookout. Like I said, hopefully that will be out later today. Uh, if not, first thing tomorrow, whenever the recording is available. Uh, but that does conclude our presentation for today. Uh, so I do want to thank all of our doctors for being here today. Uh, great job. Thank you to all of our attendees uh, for listening. And for all of those who are watching the recording uh, offline, I uh, hope you enjoyed this presentation and feel free to reach out at a later time as well. Uh, and also thank you for Dr. Ferris 
uh, for joining us earlier as well. Uh, appreciate having you uh, and helping organize this as well. Uh, so with that being said, thank you everyone, appreciate it.